On May 14, 2025, the Sun flexed its muscles and unleashed a solar flare of the highest class, X2.7. This resulted in radio interference in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. But was this just a brief solar disturbance, or a serious warning that shows us how vulnerable our technological civilization is? Today, we'll show you how solar flares and solar storms occur, why they affect our technology, what dangers a coronal mass ejection poses, and how likely it is that such a CME will actually hit us. So be sure to stay tuned until the end if you want to know which systems are most vulnerable and how we can respond in the event of an emergency. On May 14th, astronomers watched spellbound as the solar region AR4087, a huge magnetic field area that had been bubbling restlessly for days, finally reached its peak at 10.25 a.m. our time, releasing its stored energy in an explosion of the highest magnitude a solar flare of category X2.7. This released enormous amounts of X-ray and ultraviolet radiation, which shot toward Earth at the speed of light. When the radiation hit the upper atmosphere of our home planet after only eight minutes, the D layer, the lowest layer of the ionosphere, was particularly strongly ionized, leading to sudden high-frequency radio interference. High-frequency communications broke down in Europe Asia, and the Middle East. Pilots reported interruptions on radio channels, and ships also had to switch to alternative communication systems. GPS signals were temporarily less reliable, and satellites in low orbit experienced turbulence on a smaller scale. A few hours later, the disturbance was over, but what exactly had happened? How does a solar flare actually occur? And what is the difference between the various terms used to describe it? Well, it all starts in the active zones of the Sun, such as the AR4087 region. There, the magnetic fields are extremely turbulent, and the magnetic field lines store enormous amounts of energy that can build up over days or weeks. We can imagine the magnetic fields as stretched rubber bands that can only hold the amount of energy for a certain amount of time. Ultimately, the inevitable happens. The balance becomes unstable, and the magnetic fields tear and collapse abruptly. Experts refer to this process, in which the structure of a magnetic field changes abruptly, as magnetic reconnection. In the process, the stored energy is released explosively, and the solar flare is complete. This mainly produces radiation. A solar storm, on the other hand, describes the actual effects on Earth, which are usually caused by a coronal mass ejection, or CME for short. This refers to enormous clouds of charged particles and plasma that our mother star ejects into space. Unlike normal solar flares, matter and energy are ejected together. A typical CME can contain billions of tons of plasma and travel at speeds of hundreds to over a thousand kilometers per second. This often happens when magnetic fields bulge above an active region of the sun, forming a kind of magnetic bubble that eventually bursts. The size, speed, and direction of the CME depend on the magnetic field structure and the energetic instability in the affected region. However, if the cloud races toward Earth, it can trigger a geomagnetic storm, and that has dramatic consequences. When a CME hits Earth. In fact, the question of what exactly happens when we are hit by a coronal mass ejection is not purely theoretical because humanity has already experienced it firsthand. Specifically, this refers to the infamous Carrington event of 1859, when the largest solar storm ever observed by scientists hit Earth. At that time, astronomer Richard Carrington in Surrey, England, saw something completely unexpected through his telescope. Where there had previously been dark spots on the sun, two bright points of light suddenly appeared, which dimmed again moments later. At first, no one knew what this meant, but it was clear that the next morning, inexplicable things were happening almost everywhere in the world. Dancing auroras, normally only seen in the far north and south, suddenly appeared even over Hawaii and Cuba. Telegraphs went haywire, spitting out sparks, and in some cases even continued to run after employees had turned off the power. The mysterious spectacles caused fear and terror around the globe, but today, 
we know that the Carrington event was not caused by dark forces, but was due to a massive magnetic explosion on the Sun. Along with this extremely high-energy radiation flash, our mother star also hurled a cloud of charged particles far into space. The bottom line is that the energy of this solar storm was so enormous that it severely distorted the Earth's protective magnetic field when it collided with it. As a result, charged particles reached far into the upper atmosphere, triggering discharges and auroras. However, it's in the nature of things that telegraph offices have become somewhat rarer these days, and that our world is significantly different from that of 1859. So what would happen if a CME hit Earth today? As we know, we are now heavily dependent on satellites, GPS, high-frequency radio, and power grids. A Carrington Event 2.0 could therefore mean global communication and power grid failures. But what does that mean in concrete terms? Well, first and foremost, high-frequency radio would be immediately affected. HF radio waves are reflected in the ionosphere the very layer that is heavily ionized by solar radiation. This means that aircraft, ships, and emergency services that rely on high-frequency radio could suddenly lose contact. Pilots would have to use alternative routes and communication channels, and emergency call systems would only function to a limited extent. But GPS and other satellite navigation systems would also run into difficulties. The increased electron density in the ionosphere can cause signal delays or errors, which is particularly critical for air traffic, shipping, and autonomous systems. Satellites in low Earth orbit would also be affected. The CME can heat up the upper atmosphere, causing it to expand and exposing satellites to greater air resistance. In addition, the radiation increases the risk of electronic damage and system failures. And then, of course, there are our power grids. Geomagnetic currents induced by the Earth's magnetic field can overload high-voltage power lines, damage transformers, and cause widespread power outages. Critical infrastructure such as hospitals, airports, and communication networks would be directly affected, and our technologized world would be paralyzed. What we can do in the event of an emergency it's clear that our modern civilization has so far been spared a mega solar storm like the Carrington event, but it's also clear that the next one is long overdue. Experts estimate that the sun unleashes a solar storm of this magnitude about every 100 years, but how can we respond when the time comes? Well, first of all, by doing everything we can to ensure that we don't experience any nasty solar surprises. Space agencies such as NASA and ESA monitor the sun around the clock. Satellites, such as the Solar Dynamics Observatory and the Parker Solar Pro, provide real-time data to detect CMEs at an early stage. In the future, however, ESA's Vigil Mission will also station spacecraft at the so-called Lagrange Point L5 to detect potentially dangerous solar events even earlier. This should make it possible to identify dangers four to five days earlier than before thus creating a crucial window of opportunity to take action. Fortunately, there are actually things we can do in the event of an emergency. Of course, it's not possible to prevent a solar storm itself, but we can protect our power grids and satellites by making specific preparations. For example, transformers can be partially shut down, and satellites can be put on standby or aligned so that they are shielded behind the Earth. Aircraft can avoid routes over the polar regions, and critical communication systems can be switched to alternative frequencies. And to ensure that we are not completely thrown in at the deep end in such a case, ESA recently ran a simulation of an emergency scenario. The ground team of the Sentinel-1D satellite experienced a virtual reenactment of the Carrington event to test how well the participants could operate without satellite navigation and under severe electronic interference. The coordination of the ESA departments involved was also put to the test. Divided chronologically into phases of X-ray and ultraviolet radiation, high-energy particles, and coronal mass ejection, the ESA team faced considerable challenges during the exercise. Many satellites were pushed out of their regular orbits due to radiation and particle storms, 
the increased atmospheric density led to an increase in air resistance, which affected the satellite orbits and increased the risk of collision. At the same time, damage to satellite electronics led to system failures. But despite all this, the simulation ended relatively well for the ground team. They managed to protect their satellites from the worst consequences and thus celebrate at least a partial success. In a real emergency, of course, not just one satellite would be affected, but many, and the situation on the ground could also be very different. Against this backdrop, the simulation makes it clear that we would be well advised to conduct further exercises in the future and prepare our satellites and infrastructure for such events. But when, and this is perhaps the crucial question, will the next solar storm hit us? Well, first of all, we must remember that the sun follows an approximately 11-year activity cycle, during which the number of sunspots, solar flares, and coronal mass ejections varies greatly. During the maximum phase, or in other words, the peak of the cycle, the probability of large solar flares and associated CMEs increases significantly. In contrast, there are very few eruptions during the minimum. We are currently in solar cycle 25, which is expected to peak toward the end of this year. Events such as the solar flare mentioned at the beginning of this article on May 14 clearly show that we are heading toward the peak and that the probability of CMEs hitting Earth is increasing. However, it's important to note that not every eruption is automatically directed at us. Therefore, Scientists cannot reliably predict when exactly the next solar storm will hit Earth. It depends on which active regions on the Sun are currently pointing in our direction. The overall solar cycle gives us clues about the general activity of our source of heat and life, and experts are now closely monitoring which regions could potentially become dangerous. And you should check carefully to see if you've already clicked the subscribe button. Feel free to press the thumbs up and subscribe now so you never miss a new video from us again. See you soon.